glorious day today. Look, the sun is shining. We're all here, all these bright and shiny faces that we got here, some that we haven't seen. I am back. I got over my COVID. Uh, all thanks to God, the healing touch that he's got. I know that we've had a lot of people here uh, in our assembly that have had COVID, that are currently COVID, and so we just, we, we rebuke that. We know that the Lord is going to be placing his healing touch upon all of those that, that have the illness, the sickness, they're going to get better, and they're going to rejoice in the Lord. So a couple of announcements. Next Saturday, next Saturday is the 13th. The 13th is the men's breakfast with bacon at 9 a.m. over here in the education. Bruce will be there. Bruce will be cooking it up. 
and he'll be cooking up the word. He'll be uh, he'll be providing some some words of wisdom for us from from where? From the Bible. Just from the Bible. Okay, it's special. It's the Bible. All right. Oh, and then the following Saturday, twentieth, the ladies are going to meet at eleven a.m. on the twentieth over here in the education building for their monthly ladies luncheon. I don't. Are you going to have bacon? No bacon. Uh, okay. You, you could have bacon. Who's, if you've got bacon, then some eyes will show up. But they ladies have tablecloths. So yeah, there you go. They have tablecloths. And uh, next Sunday after service, Bruce will be presenting the financials from last year. If you remember at our, at our annual meeting, we had some uh, issues with some of the bank financials that's been cleared up and so now bruce is going to present those financials for with that let's get back to praising and worshiping the lord
powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name Song before you, you silence the box of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. You are raised to life again. What a wonderful name it is! What a powerful name.
Jesus for this time Lord I thank you God that even though it's worship unto you Jesus Lord I thank you God that you apply all of this to our lives Lord that you open our eyes you open our ears Father God that Lord you give us the desire to hunger after you I thank you Jesus that you've made us one with you Father God I thank you Jesus for um, the works that you do in each and every single one of us Lord and I even thank you God that we can even partake of you God today through communion, Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for just pouring afresh of your spirit upon us again today, that even when we receive of your body and your blood, Jesus, that whatever we're holding on to, Jesus, that we can lay at your feet, Father God. And Lord, we give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory, Jesus. Jesus. Check, check, check. There we go.
think your microphone's on. Is it not working? Yeah. Okay. We'll try. I was just trying to talk loud. Just oh, well, and you were doing a good job. <laughs> All right, is that better? Woo! Oh, there we go. All right, if the ushers would come, we'd like to uh, hand out communion today. We just want to take time to remember what God has done in our life. And, um, you know, every time I come to the communion table, you know, this is a chance for us to remember. It's to lock us out of religion, you know, and, and for us to remember that, hey, I'm not anything without Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, what he did for me. And it's a time for me to apply that to, you know, we take it monthly here, so kind of apply that to the month. Hey, where in my life this month have I needed Jesus's forgiveness? Have I needed his strength? Have I needed his healing? You know, we're going to talk a little bit today about how Jesus has the authority to forgive sins and to heal our body. I mean, that's huge. I mean, we sin. We have all these issues. And also the Bible says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Now, this week at work, we went over these things. They're called ACEs. And basically, it talks about trauma that people go through. And they, the stat came out, like, if you go through certain childhood traumas, like, your risk of many, many things are a lot higher. And as I went through those things, I'm like, well, I think I'm off the charts on those. But I serve a Jesus that died, and he rose again, and he gave, poured out his blood, and he is chastised. Peace, right? Our sanity is upon him. And we live in a world right now telling people, well, if you've had these things, we have Jesus. Amen? Amen. Check this out. This scripture is really fun about communion today. So Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food. Everybody say real food. And my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will remain in me and I in them. Just as the Father sent me, I, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this uh, bread will live forever. You know, when we celebrate communion, we celebrate the resurrection power of Jesus. Amen? And it's so powerful in our life. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, you know, he, he, can, he can rise those situations of our life from the dead. This morning when I walked in, as we're about to take the bread today, you know, Bill was telling me of, of names, and I was looking as I was around, because I've, we've had prayer requests for some people in the house, and they haven't been able to be in the house for a few weeks. And I was looking as I came in. I'm like, they're back. And I looked over there. They're back. And I looked over there. They're back. I'm not going to say your, your health problems because I believe in privacy and all that. But I, I'm back. And the Lord. And out of the same breath, he shared, well, there's some folks that are going through this this week. And how many know that by his stripes we are healed? Amen. Yeah. And this morning as we take communion together, if you'd stand with me, let's take of the bread together. And as we're doing that, we're, we're remembering that, that Jesus gave his body for our healing. He gave it for our bodily healing. And today we need to stand on that for some folks. For those that are standing here as testimonies as God has already healed you. And for those that can't be here, we're standing with them, that God will heal them today. Amen. Brother Bruce, would you pray for the, the body today? Amen, amen. Let's partake of the body today. There's a story we're going to read later today where Jesus, they brought someone in who needed healed, and he goes, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, what? 
And he said, so that you know that I can forgive sins, I'm going to heal this guy. And just as God has healed people in the body today, God can forgive our sins. Amen? Amen. And when we drink the blood today, we don't, we don't have to offer a sacrifice. That sacrifice has been made for us. And I want you to know that Jesus forgives all of our sins through this blood. Amen? We have no hope without it. It's through the blood. It's by the blood. And today we celebrate that as we partake together. Brother Steve, would you pray for the blood? Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is in the house. Now, if you weren't able to be here with us last week, the Lord dropped a message on my heart. It was called God is greater. And how many know God is greater? He's greater than anything you face in life. And I was kind of setting up this whole principle of spiritual authority. And the key to walking in spiritual authority is to remember that our God is greater. And last week we learned that he's greater than anything. He can overcome any issue. He can get us through anything that we're going through. Amen? The scripture that we emphasized was he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And how many know that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Amen? And this morning, I want to talk a little bit about spiritual authority, and I want to talk about the authority we have through Jesus Christ. And to do that today, we're going to get in the book of Matthew. And, and as I was studying authority and spiritual authority, Matthew seemed to be the, 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 the hotbed of, of spiritual authority and how Jesus came into authority, what his authority is like, how he wants us to exercise it in our life. Just the book of Matthew had many instances when they talk about the authority of Jesus Christ. So most of the scriptures we're in today is going to be about how Jesus has all authority and it's found in the book of Matthew. So let's start in Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Of course, it'll be on the screen for you today. Uh, let's read it today. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. Everybody say authority. Not as their teachers of the law. So these people had been going to a temple and they'd been hearing sermons. They didn't hear speak, people speak. And when Jesus came and spoke, they're like, man, there's something different. There's something different about when Jesus speaks. All these other people, they speak but they don't seem to have what Jesus has. Jesus speaks with one who has authority. And Jesus came in with authority. You see, authority, you either have it or you don't. Now, I remember one time when I was a high school kid, I was, you know, back in the day when I was a kid, we spent time just hanging out in groups, like with cars. Like we would park at one restaurant, we'd all hang out there. Or like in my town, there was a river, we'd all park our cars, we'd hang out the river. So whenever there was teens around, you would assume they were doing something stupid, but they weren't always doing something stupid. But we were happened to be parked at Taco Bell, and there was like 20 of us there. Well, we went in and ate, and we were out of the cars, and we weren't doing anything. We were just talking. We had just purchased food. We ate it, and we were out of the car just talking. So this man drives up on a motorcycle, and he's wearing all leather. Now, this man was kind of puffy, okay? I'm just going to say, he's dressed like the Terminator, but he looked like Terminator that needed to diet, right? <laughs> so he was kind of bulging out of his thing, and he had on these glasses, and it was dark out. So he walks up to us, and he starts yelling at us. And we're all like, what is happening? Like, we weren't breaking any laws. And he starts saying, I'm a police officer, and you teenager, this is this, this. And he took off his sunglasses, and we see that his eyes are red, 
He's clearly drunk. And he's starting to try to, like, express authority over us. You teenagers need to do this, this, this. And we're all looking at him like, well, one, you don't have a badge on. Two, you're not in your cop car. Three, we know you're hammered drunk. So do you think the teenagers gave him respect? We all just started saying, who are you, buddy? You know, like, why are you yelling at us? You know, and, and then he started threatening, well, I'm going to call the cops. And one of my buddies goes, yeah, my dad's one of the cops. He'd like to know that a cop is drunk yelling at kids. And he got on his motorcycle and left. <laughs> but authority, you either have it or you don't. Now, if it was a police officer and we were breaking the law and he came up and he had his badge on and he hadn't been drinking and we were doing something wrong, we all would have responded way differently. But when you don't have authority, you can't just rush up on people and, and tell them these things. And, and this is kind of what they're saying. They're like, man, Jesus speaks and, and there's something legit about him. Now, the Pharisees and Sadducees of the day, we know that their motives weren't right, their hearts weren't right, and they, they weren't after the right things. But when Jesus showed up, they saw that there was something real there. Now, you know, in the church, this is what we're all looking for. When we come, we come to the house of the Lord, we're not looking for something manufactured, something whatever. We're looking for something real. Amen? I know a lot in my generation, that's one of the things that we grew up in. And people would always say, well, you need to put on appearances, you need to put on appearances, you need to put on appearances, you need to put on appearances. But if you're always putting on appearances and there's nothing real behind those appearances, eventually people say, Whew. And the Pharisees and Sadducees of the day were all about that. But Jesus came and he, he preached with absolute authority. He was real. He was legit. He was genuine. He came from heaven. He preached the power of God. Amen. And he preached this authority. See, when you're under authority, then you can walk in it and you can exercise it. Look at Matthew chapter 8. It talks more about this, this, this you know, concept of authority. And it uses this centurion. Somebody that, if you've ever been in the military, you know that, that rank and order and submission. And, you know, I'm over you and you have to follow direct orders and all these things. All that makes, make, makes sense to somebody in the military world. And, and this Roman centurion comes up, said, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. He said, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve for you to come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. He said, for I myself am a man under authority. See, this man understands authority. He knew that Jesus had the authority to, to heal his, his servant, to be there with him. He says, with, with soldiers under me, I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say, so I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and he said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such a great faith. And a little bit further on, it says, Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Amen. Amen. So this is somewhere where th this, this, this guy that exercises authority, understands authority, sees Jesus, knows that Jesus has authority to heal, knows he's, he, he must know that, that he has the power of God in him. And he comes and he asks, he said, hey. Can you do this? And Jesus said, yes. See, the Roman centurion understood the authority of Jesus. If you want something miraculous to happen in your life, you have to understand that Jesus has authority. Amen? He can do all things. He can accomplish all these things. And Jesus has authority in your life. Now, stay with me. We're going to walk, continue to walk through Matthew. Now we're in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. And it's going to talk more about authority. So Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, Take heart, son. your sins are forgiven. Now, if you were in that crowd, you would kind of think that was weird. I mean, think about it. This guy comes, he's paralyzed. You know, like, what do you think everybody expects to happen? He, Jesus heals him. He's been healing people, so someone's sick, you bring him there. He, he says, hey, man, your, you know, your sins are forgiven. Now, look what people around him said. At this point, some of the teachers of law said to themselves, 
This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, for you to say your sins are forgiven, or to say get up and walk? Now, we all know that answer. To see that actual miracle, you know, it, you know, for me to just say your sins are forgiven, you can't quantify that. Like if someone came up to you and said your sins are forgiven, you can't, you can't see that happen. But if someone is sick and, you know, especially paralyzed... And, and, and you heal them, it's, it's visually quantifiable. You're like, oh, that is a miracle. So Jesus is saying, what's harder, an actual miracle? Or for me just to say your sins are forgiven, which you can't even see. Jesus says, but I, do not, but I do want you to know that man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he proves it to them. God has given me the authority to forgive sins. I'll show you how. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. That would be an amazing miracle. You know, when people were paralyzed, usually their only profession back then was being reduced to begging. Usually that's what it was. So when people saw a paralyzed person, they knew that they had no other means, so they were known. Paralyzed people weren't usually mysterious. You know, everybody knew what was wrong with them. So when people was healed from being paralyzed, everybody they knew this person was paralyzed. They knew they were without hope. And here Jesus visually paralyzes, I mean, heals this paralyzed person in public. And the man gets up and walked home. The crowd saw this. They were filled with awe. And they praised God, who had given so much authority to man. So Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. And Jesus has the authority to heal our body. Amen? That's powerful stuff this morning. What did we just, what did we just remember at Communion. That's what we're remembering. Jesus has the power to forgive and heal, forgive our sins, and he has the power to heal our bodies. And that's worth celebrating, and that's an awesome, powerful thing. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Let's keep looking what Jesus is going to do with this authority. Matthew 10, 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them what? He gave them authority. He gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now, I don't think he gave them the ability to forgive sins, but you know, he they can ask he gave them the ability to ask the Lord to teach them to repent and forgive sins, but he gave them this ability to, to do these miracles. Verse 7 says, As you go, proclaim the message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Look what he had them do: heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. He said, Freely you have received, freely give. I want you to know that Jesus gives authority. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus gives authority. So Jesus has this ability. He has the ability to change people's lives. He has the ability to heal your body. And not just your physical body. He has the ability to, to create new life in people. As we were studying that in, in school, I was studying at school this week, this ACEs thing. And basically what it is is if you had some childhood trauma, either you were abused or you lost a parent or you were abandoned and you were all this, they, they kept saying how, how much of an effect it has on you. And as I was looking at it, I was like, I can see that from a worldly perspective. But I can tell you, person after person who was dead in their trespass, in their pain, in their sorrow, where Jesus came and resurrected their life. Amen? Amen? And I want you to know that Jesus has this authority that, that, that even if you have gone through all these things, what did he give these disciples authority to do? Go out and see the power of God change people. And I want you to know that Jesus has authority over everything. And he wants to give us, he wants to partner with us, he wants to fill our lives with the power of his Holy Spirit and give us this authority where we can see people's lives change just as he did. Amen? Amen. Let's keep reading, let's keep discovering this this morning. Matthew chapter 20. When Jesus called them together and he said, do you not know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, now, before, now Jesus is actually correcting a couple of his followers because right before this story, they're arguing over who's going to be greater in heaven. So Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. That's not what authority's for. 
It's not about who's going to be greater. He says the Gentiles live like that. But look what Jesus said. He said, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus models authority. Think about it. Jesus was all-powerful. Jesus could do anything. What did he choose to do with his authority? He chose to serve. Stephen, sometimes we ask the question, you know, and, and people used to ask me that question a lot. They say, they say, Pastor Dave, why don't people heal? Why don't people get healed, like, in this situation? Or why doesn't God use certain Christians just to manifest this healing in them? And sometimes I believe that God doesn't do that because if God does miracles through certain believers, they don't have the humility. They don't have the servant's heart. And what happens is if God starts to use them that way, then they'll abuse it. How many times have we seen that? God starts to use a pastor in a mighty way, you know, and then all of a sudden he gets an ego or something, and then he's like, then he abuses that authority. I believe that God would show up anytime. I believe God can do miracles all the time. But I think he waits for people that are willing to use, you know, be used in authority in a way that's correct. In a way that will honor him. In a way that will serve people. In a way that will, that will be a blessing. So Jesus models this. Yes, I have all this authority, but I'm going to wash my disciples' feet. Now, you know, I have a, a wife and a daughter, and they go get pedicures, you know. And I don't go get pedicures as a favor to the pedicurist. <laughs> I don't want them dealing with that stuff, right? And I wear shoes, you know, and I don't walk everywhere I go. Could you imagine those disciples' feet? One, they're a bunch of guys. Two, they're walking around everywhere. So Jesus is saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to do that job. I'm going to do the job that nobody else wants to do. I'm going to serve. Jesus models what to do with authority. As Jesus walks in authority, he models what it is to, to walk in authority. Let's look at this one, Matthew chapter 21, verse 23, more about his authority. It says, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. They asked him, they say, what authority are you doing these things, they ask, and who gave you this authority? Imagine that. Imagine calling out the creator of the world like that. Who gave you this authority? Who? You know, Jesus replied, I'll answer you with a question. He said, if you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John the Baptist, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or by human origin? John's baptism, sorry. He says, John's baptism, did it come from heaven or by human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if they say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say it's of human orbitism, we, you know, what did I say? Human origin. We are afraid of the people, for they hold all that John said was as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. So Jesus is like, he knows them. He knows that everybody thinks John's legit. He's like, hey, what was, where was John's baptism from? And these guys start getting scared of the people, and they say, we don't know. Then Jesus said this, neither I will tell you what authority I'm doing these things. You see, this morning I want you to know that Jesus' authority is unquestionable. It's unquestionable. One of, the, one of the strengths you have when you walk out in this world is you know that God is real. You know that Jesus is real. You know that the Holy Spirit is real. You know, one of the things I used to do quite often is I would go to bars. I've never been a drinker, so I've never been tempted to drink. And, but I would go to bars, and I would talk to young men, you know, especially when I was at age where guys were always going to the bar, like 20, 23 I do it a lot on college campuses. I would just go in and I would, I would talk to them about their faith. And people had asked me, they'd say, Dave, why, why do you do that? And, you know, do people listen to you? And I said, yeah, they always do. They say, well, why do they do it? I go, I go, because everybody 
what does Romans chapter, you know, what does Romans teach us about the witness of nature? Everybody's created the image of God, and by witness of nature, they know that God is real, but they suppress the truth with their what? Evil deeds. So when I walk up to any human in the world, what do I know? Well, one, God made this person. Two, inside of them is this witness of nature. They know God is real, and they might have it pushed way down. But it's at that confidence level you can approach someone and know that, hey, this person's made the image of God. And even if they've shoved it way, 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 way down, somewhere in them is the voice of God. It's from that position you speak, and when we speak, we speak the truth. I have a friend of mine, he's an, he's an atheist, and he's an atheist, I don't want to say honestly, but he was abandoned by his father, and his mother had men in her life that were not good, and he eventually ended up just tossed to grandma, and she raised him in church, and grandma and grandpa were amazing Christians, but everything that happened with mom and dad was just, you know, bad, and then dad later on in life gets a new family and becomes a pastor and never talks to him, and so he thinks that God's not real, and he doesn't just not like God, he he almost hates God. And one time I just said to him, because he's always trying to, like, prove that God's not real, this and this, and we're buddies, and he knows I love him. He was actually in my wedding. He grew up in church with us, rebelling the whole time, but I loved him, and I know that somewhere in there, Jesus is going to get him. And I said to him one time, I said, I go, you know what, Shane, there's a thin line between love and hate. He said, what do you mean? I go, man, you hate God so much. I go, maybe it's because you actually love him and you're just resisting him. See, in my heart of hearts, I believe that that dude knows there's a God. And even though bad stuff has happened to him, I'm still going to walk in that authority that God is going to reach him someday. And just like his grandma prays and just like I pray for him. One day, that power of God, I have this authority. I don't care if he has 8,000 atheist arguments to come against him. The truth, not him. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Amen. Amen. Jesus is, is like this whole thing. We're questioning Jesus' authority. Jesus' authority is unquestionable. Amen. We don't have to fear the arguments or the ridiculousness of the world. We have the truth. Amen. And our world is getting more and more ridiculous. You and me, we just claim the truth louder. We have to keep proclaiming it in love, and we have to keep remembering that it's real and it's unquestionable. Amen? All right, let's keep studying this. Jesus has some awesome things. He, he walks in authority, and I want you to see something today. All right, here we go. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. This is a great commission. And those that know it, you probably have a lot of it memorized. The verse right before it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says, I have it all. He says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus is giving us this partnership with him. He has all the authority, and he says, hey, now that, now that I have all this authority, I'm sending you out to reach the world for me. See, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Amen? He has it all. Look what Colossians says about Jesus. I want you to catch who Jesus is because he's so awesome, he's so powerful, and if once you get that in your heart, you don't have to be afraid of anything. You don't have to be worried about anything. You don't have to... You know, God can use you to do anything. Look what Colossians 1 says. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, invisible and visible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powerties. All things. Someone say all things. All things were created through him and for him. Let's keep reading. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And if he is the head of the body of the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn 
among the dead, so that in all things he may have preeminence. Or another translation would say supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. I want you to know that Jesus is control of everything. You know why I love this verse? I always read this verse. Every time someone asks me to do a funeral, I, I, I read this verse. And the reason I, I do it is because Jesus is, is through it all. This scripture, he, was, he created all things. You know, when we look in the book of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created, you know, all this. Then we read John, and what does it say? It says everything was created through Jesus. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him. So Jesus was involved in creation. What's this, what's this other thing? It says all things in him hold together. What does that mean? He's sustaining everything right now. He had authority over creation. He's sustaining everything right now. I, I, these, these people, I've been, I've been they, this creation of the world arguments. They always act like, oh, man, the world accidentally created himself, and the world accidentally holds itself together. I'm like, you have more faith than me. If I put a basketball on my finger and try to spin it, it takes a lot to keep that dude going, right? What happens if I stop spinning the ball? But you want me to believe that the whole world, the whole universe accidentally just keeps spinning? No one's correcting it. No one's, no one's, no one's making it happen. Like, it's just, you want me to believe that? If I believe that, I'd be a nervous wreck. <laughs> Wake up today, is the sun going to explode? Sun's looking kind of hot. It might blow up. Is a meteor going to hit us today? He's the creator. He's the sustainer. If you believe the world accidentally created itself, you believe it accidentally sustains itself. And you're just hoping in an accident to keep going. To me, you have more faith than I do. And what's the next part say? It says Jesus is the firstborn among the dead. That means he has authority over what? What's next? He created everything. He holds everything together. He's the firstborn among the dead. So when we pass away, the same Jesus that created you, the same Jesus that sustained you, is the same Jesus that's going to be with you. What does the Bible say? The absent of the body is present with what? So in all things, he has supremacy. Every area of our life, in the past, in the present, in the future, God's over it all. He's over it all. What kind of authority do we have in Christ? He has it all. Check this one out. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. It talks about some pretty cool things. Let's get it. Ephesians chapter 2, it says, As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins and when, in, in which you used to live. And follow the ways of the world and the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is at, now at work with those who are disobedient. Now, guys, I've experienced some of that in my life. I was away from God a little bit personally. But if you look at my family life, my, my, my dad's family was completely away from Christ. So I have this comparison in my world of my mom's family that knows the Lord and then my dad's family that's just in all the brokenness that comes with that. And when I read a scripture like this, I just I understand that as for me, I was part of this. If Jesus didn't come to my family's life, I would be lost. I would be broken. I would have nothing. But Jesus did come. And Jesus did save. Jesus did heal. Jesus did reach my dad. And I'm saved, and I love Jesus, and I was dead in trust us. But now, Jesus has come and rescued me and saved me, and I am so thankful for that. And I want to tell you today, you may be sitting in a mix, and you may come in here and say, Pastor Dave, well, you don't know how bad I am. You don't know how bad the Carringtons were. And Jesus rescued us. You're never too far gone. See, Jesus is over the beginnings. He's over what's happening right now. And he's over the future. And there's nothing that your family can be involved in that God doesn't have authority over. And he can't bring you out of it. Amen? Amen. Now, look, it said all of us, it says everybody, all of us at one time gratified the, the cravings of the sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of Christ. But because of God's great love for us, who in his rich mercy, he made us alive with Christ. Someone say alive. 
alive with Christ. That's resurrection power. He, even though we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive in Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. Now look at this next verse. This is really crazy. Ephesians 2, I think verse 6, it says this. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us. Somebody say seated us. It seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming days he might show the so the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I just want to pause right there, and I want you to think about that for a minute. Now, if you, if you read through the, the New Testament and Jesus dies and, and, and rose again, then he ascends into heaven. Now, what does the Bible say, say, say happens when he ascends into heaven? He ascends into heaven, he pours out his Holy Spirit, and then what does he do? He sits down. And he sits down and he says, you know, they're going to put the, you know, they're going to put the world under my feet at this point. So Jesus sits in his authority. He sits in that power. Guys, this, this verse is saying that we get to sit with Jesus. That we get to sit next to Jesus. That we get to sit in heavenly places with Jesus. We get to sit in that power so that he can show us off. Look what they used to be. Now look who they are. Look what they used to be. Now they're mine. Now, now I, they're, they're, they're with me. They can do all things through me. Now they're mine. They're seated with me in heavenly places. Church, do we know how much authority we have when we, we partner with Jesus? Do we know how awesome it is that we can have this relationship with Jesus? That, that we can live this, we can do this thing. As far grace you have been saved through faith is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance to do. You and me were created to do great things to the Lord. This morning I want you to know that you're seated with Jesus. That's powerful. Now we are in two places at one time. We're here, but our spirits and, you know, spiritually in the heavenly realms, we're seated. But here we are on earth. And for me and you, we, we have to decide what authority are we going to listen to? Just like Jesus, when he was out in the desert, what happened? The, the spiritual, you know, the spiritual forces of the world, the devil came up and he said, hey, you know, come follow Come follow this authority. Live by the authority of the world. Do all this. And Jesus is like, come on, man. See, me and you are seated in heavenly places. And we have this authority of spiritual family. Jesus, our brother, who rescued us and gave us a place with the Father. And we're seated. And we have authority over all the broken and hurting that the same Jesus that gave us this resurrection power that took us from death to life, he has that same power to do that to every person that we see. He has that authority over their unbelief, over their struggle, over their brokenness, over their... Jesus has the authority to heal and save and change. And he says, I'm going to give it to you. He's given that to you and me. And he says, freely you have received, freely what? What kind of authority do we walk in, church? It's the ultimate authority. It was before all things. It's holding everything together. It knows the future. And it's our joy, it's our responsibility, it's our life that we get to share with God. We know we're going to be there one day, but it's, it's, our, it's our job now to use this authority to change the world. So no one has authority over you. Now, obviously, you have your work authorities, and God tells us to submit to those authorities. And unless they tell us to do something that God doesn't want us to do, and then we have to submit to the Lord. 
But God has given us this power through the Holy Spirit to speak into situations, to speak into these things, and God can change it. God can renew it. And this world around you may say, well, these people are, they've had this happen to them, so they're destined to this. You used to be. But this is who you're going to be. And me, we didn't say, hey, you may feel like who you are, but Jesus has the authority in your life to make you something new. And we have to embrace it through the power of the Holy Spirit coming into our life and going before us, moving into others, saying, hey, you know, the Bible says no one comes unless the Spirit draws them, praying for God to draw them, for them to know who he is, and then speaking in authority, in love. This is what Jesus wants to do in your life and in our world. Jesus sent him out. What did he say? He said, hey, go, go. Heal the sick. Throw out the demons. Raise the dead. <laughs> I mean, raise the dead. That could be physical. That could be spiritual. But God has given you and me the authority to change our world. Let's walk in it. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I just invite you into this house. I, uh, Lord, you're here. Lord, you love the people of God. Lord, as we, I look around the room, I see trophies, your, your handiwork of grace, how you've taken people from darkness to light. You've changed people's lives and moved. But Lord, I also know that there are people in the room today that may feel overwhelmed by the kingdoms of this world. They've submitted to the wrong authorities in their life. They've submitted to patterns of this world. They've submitted to these things and that things. But, Lord, you, you, you said it's by your grace we are saved and that you have the ability to forgive our sins. So, Lord, if there's anybody in the house today that has submitted to the wrong things, that have let the things of the world have authority in their life, Lord, today it's so simple. Just like that. That guy that was paralyzed, he came to the house of the Lord thinking, man, I need healing. I need my body to be healed. And Jesus said, well, more than that, you need your sins forgiven. Today, you may be here and you may think there's some things in you need from God. You need this from God. You need that for God. But the main thing you need is to submit to the Lordship of Christ. And you to say, God, I'm putting myself under your authority. I'm seating myself in heaven with you so that I can do what you want me to do in this world. Church, this morning as we're praying, I, I just want to remind you what he say. He says, all authority and in heaven on earth has been given to me. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth, both past, present, and future. We learned that in Colossians. Jesus says he has it all. And he looks to you and he says, therefore, I'm giving it to you. Go and reach this world for me. Go and reach this world for me. Church, this morning, I just I want you to wrap that around your heart today. We live in this world and sometimes we think authority has authority over its silliness. God created this earth. God holds it together. He's in control of the future. God created you. He holds you together. He gives you the breath you're breathing right now. He knows your future. He's going to be with you when you leave this world. And he loves you. And he wants you to walk in differently. He wants you to walk empowered. He wants you to walk in victory. He wants you to walk in, in sonship and in daughtership and in, in strength. He wants you to walk in it. So this morning, I want you to know God has given you authority. Would you stand with me, church? Would you stand with me?
I would just ask you to pray a prayer of submission with me this morning. I'm praying the same prayer. Let's pray. Say, dear Jesus, we submit to your authority. However you want to lead, however you want to guide, we need you. Show me today that you can do anything, that you are all-powerful, that you are all-knowing, that you can use me, that you can forgive me of anything, that you can heal my mind, that you can heal my body, that you can reach my family, and that you can touch this world. Lord, help me to walk in that authority and to understand that I'm seated with you in heavenly places. God, use me. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. This morning, the Lord said it, not me. I'm saying it too, but I'm just repeating it. He says, Jesus said what? All authority in heaven has been given to me and on earth. Therefore, go. And church, our goal is to make it as it is in heaven as it here on earth. Amen? Until he takes us there, let's, let's bring it here. Amen? God bless you. Hug someone's neck. I'm glad you're in the house of the Lord today. Back on Wednesday night, if you need prayer for anything, come on up. Great to see you all.